Hi. Hi. Finally, and hi everybody out there joining us. Thank you so much for your patience. We just had a little technical hiccup. Um, I'm Sophie Wadzak, research communication specialist for the Duolingo English Test, and we're so excited to have you here. Um, I'm gonna just give everybody a few minutes to log on because um, I know we were a little late getting started. We're very excited about our talk today, and it's great to see so many of you here. Okay. Um, I think, let's see. Oh yes, plenty of people are joining. Anthony, I think I'll hand it to you. I will introduce you all to my colleague, Dr. Anthony Coonan, who will introduce today's speaker. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, everyone. Welcome to uh, our fourth edition of uh, the webinar series in Innovations in Language Assessment. Today's speaker is Professor Okim Kang from Northern Arizona University. Um, I'm sure that for most of you, she needs no introduction, but uh, just to tell you briefly, she's a professor uh, at the university, uh, in Northern Arizona University, as I said, and she has many um, uh, research interests. Her research interests include second language speech and intelligibility, speech perception and production, speech technology and automated uh, speech recognition, ASR, and uh, generally uh, in assessment. Today, her topic is understanding language for automated assessment of speaking. So I'll hand it over to Okim right away. Okay, <laughs> Thank go you, ahead, Okim. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. Um, this is really an exciting opportunity for me since I could share some of the new findings and uh, some issues that we could think about, uh, especially for the topic of speaking assessment. Uh, since everyone could be all over the places, all around the world, which is also very special. Uh, I'm from Northern Arizona here in Flagstaff. We are on very high altitude, 7,000 feet, uh, very close to Grand Canyon and Sedona. So the weather is sunny, it's a very nice day. I'm gonna uh, talk about uh, speaking and speaking assessment. I'll start with some uh, construct definitions. Also the main part, understanding language for the automated speaking assessment. So I will share uh, findings related to linguistic features. Uh, and I'm gonna spend some quite a bit of time on this topic uh, later, uh, automated speaking assessment itself and issues related to feedback. And I'll end my talk with um, future directions. Okay, so what is speaking? Conceptually, uh, speaking is one of men's most complex skills. I'm sure many of you agree. Uh, you know, the section of the skill, it is a scientific endeavor. Um, and speaking is an interactive process. So constructing meaning, it involves producing, receiving, processing information. So uh, Lavelle says a speaker is a highly complex information processor. So we're gonna talk about those interactive aspects as well. When it comes to the linguistic definitions of speaking, speaking can be broadly subdivided into linguistic and functional aspects. So linguistic aspects can include fluency, pronunciation, lexical, grammatical resources, right? But the functional part can include the pragmatic ability. Assessing speaking is also a very difficult and uh, cannot be reliable sometimes. Assessor has to make instantaneous uh, judgment about the, the all different aspects of speaking. And also here, uh, the aspects of language use is a source of bias in test scores. So here are test developers, you know, if raters focus uh, attention only on pronunciation, grammar, fluency, and comprehensibility, but then many other factors can still play together uh, when it make this decision. So it's a, it's a very complicated process and I'm sure many of us agree, right? I wanna start with this uh, a perception issue. So you speak, but you also perceive, right? And the book Senses Considered as a Perceptual Systems. This is one of the books that has inspired me for a long time. Uh, James Gibson uh, called the human sound perception is all interrelated. 
So you hear sound through your ear, but you also get to perceive things through your nose, through your physical sense. It's a combination of everything. Besides, uh, perception is a knowledge of the environment. So you don't just hear and perceive. It's really all together. Uh, if you look at the chart, the figure on the right, this is a relatively well-known uh, figure. And I'm originally a phonetician. So this is the study that I got to be introduced early on. Ellen Lieberman, 1957. The figure three that you see is a spectrographic patterns that produce sound D and G. The top one is D and bottom one is G. And it is produced with a different vowel environment. So here D, D, the ga the u. As you can see, the spectrogram features or the properties are all different because the vowel changes, right? Bottom one, the same thing with the g. It changes all throughout. However, you as listeners, when you hear any of these sounds, you constantly hear d or g. So basically, what it says is it's nothing to do with acoustic properties sometimes. It's all about what you hear in your head. So that's a difficult part of our human perceptions. So Sophie, uh, this one I need to ask. I have a very quick um, item for us to think about. And it could be one, two, three, four, five. I mean, this is like a basic question. So what, what factors can influence our judgments? You should see this on your screen now. So we'll give everybody a, a minute to respond and then I'll share the results. I have two polling okay. items throughout the talk. Yes, so we'll have another one in a in a few, you know, in a little while. But this one, uh -huh. people are responding so quickly today. People are all right. So let's see what do we have. Okay, I'll see. We've got we're at um, we're almost at hundred rate completion. So I'll just give it one more minute and then I'll launch it because the results are still coming in. Okay, all right. I'm going to share now, and we'll see. We'll see if you're surprised by the by the answers. Let's share the results. Yeah, all of above. I agree. A lot of, oh, some people said the previous experience, 6%, uh, all of above and others. Yes. Uh, there's a chat. Yes. Huh? Um, Sebastian Dubril, he says, I am reassured by the fact that the voices I hear are just in my head. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I agree. I agree. All right. So let's, uh, let me share. This is relatively well-known study that I conducted with my colleague, um, Don Rubin, 2009. You see these two pictures. Uh, picture on the left is a Caucasian male professor. Uh, I prepared astronomy lecture recorded by the standard American accent. And that lecture was played with a picture on the left on the screen projected, and another time picture on the right projected on the screen. And American undergrad students, listeners, they took this, uh, you know, listened to the lectures and then took the listening comprehension test. Once again, it was the same speech accent and relatively same content, but listening comprehension scores was significantly different by the fact that the listening uh, on with a picture on the left was a significantly higher, thinking that the picture on the right, the lecture had an accent. So it's all about in the head, right? This idea is called reverse linguistic stereotyping. I'm gonna use this term again. So I would like to teach this uh, paradigm a little bit in details. This concept is opposite of a linguistic stereotyping paradigm. So reverse social identity ascribed to the speaker can evoke linguistic expectancy, can lead to stereotyped evaluation. In other words, you see me as an Asian woman, right? And then you will say, oh, she must be X, Y, Z. Then you make your own judgment. So what you see sometimes determines what you decide. So based on this kind of um, stereotyping factor, here attitudinal and other background factors can influence up to 20, 18 to 23% of the variance in our listening judgments. Many, many studies have looked at uh, background factors uh, stereotyping, I just shared the 2009 study, accent familiarity, topic familiarity, shared L1 effects, training effects, or your first language status, right? So one quick example is if you're native speakers, 
you tend to be, according to my 2012 study, you are a little bit lenient. If you have a bad experience with the non-native speakers, you are harsher. You know, if you have a lot of teaching experience, sometimes you tend to be more lenient. So a lot of these factors can affect, you know, our judgments. So this one study, just looking at these background factors, again, uh, variables included uh, native speaker status, their contact, or these reverse linguistic stereotyping. I looked at the stereotyping factors as well. 82 novice raters, they uh, listened to the TOEFL spoken responses and rated for their speaking proficiency. And uh, once I collected uh, their scores, they were extreme, extremely uh, lenient raters versus extremely severe raters. I chose those 40 raters and let them take ETS's uh, training session, rater training sessions. And here, as you can see, the, the column, second column is pre-training, third column is post-training. So the first one, the holistic scores, let's take a look at this. First one, I mean, keep in mind that those are 40 extreme raters, very lenient or very severe. Their <laughs> rating was explained by like a 40% of the, their rating. Oh no, sorry, 53% of the ratings uh, was explained by their background factors. But after the training, it went down to 12%. So training really worked. But what do we know? This takes time. It was a very expensive training, everyone. You know, six, eight hours would pay them significantly. So a lot of these issues can lead to an alternative option, which is automated speaking assessment, right? And we hear this a lot more now than before. So advances in artificial intelligence, computer technology, so now we know automated scoring system can definitely give us a score faster and less expensive. Also consistencies, they're not like humans, so there's no subjectivity, right? No stereotyping factors. So consistencies and instant scoring feedback is the benefit. However, they also have some challenges, right? It's not always just all good and easy. Uh, the accuracy, technology accuracy issue is always there. I'm gonna come back to this uh, error rate a little bit. Uh, we have to rely on technology all the time and technical uh, difficulties happen, you know, we know uh, sometimes unexpectedly. Task differences, con uh, currently controlled spontaneous task can be used, uh, but you know, active task is extremely difficult to process. Sensitivity to background noise, the sound quality makes a huge difference. Also test takers perception. Uh, like some people don't necessarily like to have this whole automatic, you know, the computer system type of ass assessment. And what does this mean to our classroom, our teaching and learning, the washback effect? So a lot of things to consider. Uh, when it comes to these uh, two task types, um, we have a constrained and unconstrained speech. Constrained speech is more of the controlled speech, which is easier to automate, uh, especially you know, reading a sentence or read aloud. Uh, this one, you pretty much have your own computer model as a standard, uh, let's say, standard American accent, and then your own task takers input sound file, and you look at the deviation. So let's say I'm reading, I like potato versus I like potato. You know, you see the huge differences, right? You can look at the deviations pretty quickly and accurately. So this is an easier uh, uh, process. Whereas unconstrained speech, this is unpredictable, very difficult to process. You don't know what the speaker would say, what the input's gonna be. So here, this is like a direct citation. Most automated uh, scoring studies on a spontaneous speech still employ only a limited set of features. Why? Because there is a challenges. There are difficulties in processing spontaneous speech. And I hear, I see that problem myself as well. So if you look at this chart, um, the Y X, uh, X represents word error rate. So the higher means more errors. 
and the horizontal line is the CEFR level, the proficiency level. Let's look at the blue line. Blue line is controlled speech, read aloud. The red line is spontaneous speech, unconstrained speech. If you look at this chart, you can see as speakers' proficiency increases, the error rate, accuracy increases, the, the line's going down, right? That basically means you can imagine the computer is going to process the standard or native, um, you know, the, the norm accents a lot more accurately than the non-native, like with heavy accents, right? So this is an issue. Another one, if you look at uh, the blue line versus red line, constrained speech is much more accurate than the spontaneous speech, right? So this is something I already mentioned. Okay, so let's look at linguistic features. What do we have to think about when it comes to speaking assessment? So now uh, I'm gonna play two sound files. These are actually scored by expert raters from one to four. Uh, and let's see how we can score this ourselves. Well, I think uh, there's many new information nowadays. Uh, it's getting more and more new information nowadays. And then uh, it's quite important to, for, for us to remember some of them. Uh, for example, like, um, like some knowledge, like, uh, okay. So this is once again, from one, uh, very low proficiency for very high proficiency. I'm going to play another one. I think I will, um, especially compare and contrast these two pictures on, on the button. Um, the first one, uh, the one on the left, you can see a little boy, I would say. He's in the zoo, uh, I, I, I suppose so, and he's just uh, waving at the beer, at the beer there. All right. I mean, it's supposed to be a whole one minute long. I kind of shortened it. Um, okay. Some people. Are, so, what scores did you give? I'm gonna see. Oh, this is like uh, you could share, but actually, the first one received four. Second one received three by expert raters, but I'm sure many of you may not agree because I myself, when I first listened to this, the first one was little, I would say second one was a little better than the first one, but the actual official uh, expert raters gave me the opposite. So again, that's the issue with the speaking. On what basis do, did we make this judgment, right? And let's take a look at this. Measures of a speaking performance requires a different kind of scale, such as those in the rating performance in the sports competition. I like this part, actually. I kind of agree. The quality of the figure skater's performance in Olympic games, right? We don't necessarily look at the exact scales one by one, although they all receive scores and then they combine and they rank. But this statement kind of makes us think Speaking is a real performance-based skill, right? So something to think about. So speaking proficiency can be defined as a speaking ability demonstrated by the L2 learners. It can be knowledge, competence, and ability. But when it comes to the term ability versus proficiency, ability is more of an internal construct versus proficiency is an observable manifestations of it. But we tend to use these two terms interchangeably in the assessment, I think. But still, we really don't know what proficiency uh, entails in a speaking performance. So that's the problem. Sophie, this is my second question. Okay, I'm ready. All right, so let's try this. Okay, let's try this one. All right, it's, it's launched. What linguistic features are most frequently considered in speaking assessment and or automated speaking assessment? Got a lot of choices here. Now, if you are a test item developer, this is a bad item because number six is too long, right? Each multiple choice option should be relatively <laughs> similar. So don't judge me in that respect. I know number six is not the best. Sometimes you have to deviate from the of, of model just to be able to get all the content in. Okay, we've got um, oh, the answers are still rolling in, so I'll just give people a minute. I think people had to take a second to think about that. 
before applying. Okay. Got a few more answers coming in. I think we're good. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna All share right. it now because I think we have a conclusive answer. Here we go. Ah, now responses vary. Many of you, 22% uh, of you said speech rate. So that many of you think speech rate is an important uh, element. Grammar, 15%. And 49% chose number six, option six. All right, so let's uh, go through these features one by one. Rating criteria and speaking assessment. Again, we listened to two sound files already and it was a bit difficult for us to decide, right? Whether it's gonna be three or four or two. Uh, the first one is IELTS speaking rubric. Second one is TOEFL uh, speaking rubric. I'm sure many of you are familiar. Uh, the issue here is, especially for a person like me who's been doing the linguistic analysis, the relationship between rating scores and speaking features are never straightforward. And that has been a problem. Also, this is never a, a linear relationship, especially the adjacency levels of proficiency is not that easy to distinguish, right? So let's take a look. Lack of consistent differences. This one, I analyzed the Cambridge English Assessment speech files, 120 files several years ago. And especially the very top orange line, there's a number of error-free T unit. This is a grammatical complexity, by the way. And the blue one represents number of a dependent T, uh, clause. These two variables were pretty significant predictors of the proficiency. But if you look at B1 and C2, a big difference, but B2 and C1, not much of the difference. Same thing with the fluency. Many of you mentioned fluency is an important feature. Yes, it is. And especially syllable per second, how many syllables you produce per second. B1, C2, a vast difference, quite significant, especially syllable per second itself. But B2 and B1 is an issue. Uh, my team recently analyzed IELTS uh, spoken files, um, and we went through the same linguistic analysis. In this case, vocabulary, especially the first 1,000 words, how many, uh, how frequently you used, that was a very strong predictor of the IELTS proficiency score. And here IELTS score starting from four all the way to 7.5, but starting from score six to 7.5, you don't really see the changes. So this is an issue in our speaking. You don't really look at the, uh, get to see it very nice pattern of the linear relationship. So this is uh, more of the linguistic features that I kind of combined by using two uh, high stake test uh, rubrics. And also I adopted from uh, Rebecca Hughes, 2017. So for the pronunciation, we can see the terms phonemes, stress, intonation. Oh, we see the term intelligibility, effortless to understand means comprehensibility. Fluency, you look at the speech rate, agitation, repetition, like a breakdown fluency, we call it. Grammar complexity, sometimes range of grammar structure. Uh, vocabulary, the vocabulary range, insufficient vocabulary. So you see these terms, uh, coherence and topic uh, uh, relevance. You see the term appropriate cohesive features. Again, these features can mean uh, somewhat different things for different people, but these are the terms we get to see in our assessment and text. Uh, many, many studies have looked at uh, linguistic features, but I have only included here uh, for those studies who looked at some high stake um, spoken uh, uh, responses, like spoken test responses. So especially TOEFL and IELTS mm -hmm. and Cambridge English assessment. So fluency feature was always uh, the top one. And there were some features on grammatical accuracy and complexity. Uh, sometimes the term itself could be a bit vague. 
you know, accuracy means like, um, you know, how many errors complexity means like whether you create complex sentences, more clause, uh, lexical resources and pronunciation. And me as a phonetician, I'm going to spend a little more time explaining these uh, pronunciation features. Um, I've included all of these pronunciation features uh, to analyze one time uh, several years ago in 2013 and looked at relationship between these features and Cambridge um, English assessment, uh, CEFA scores. And according to that findings, stress and pitch was the most uh, prominent factor. Uh, about 30% was explained by these features and fluency definitely and segmental and tone choices. So I'm going to explain one by one. Uh, stress pro uh, pitch means prominence and lexical stress. So this one, we just did an analysis uh, this year with uh, and my research team. We looked at 108 different L2 speakers, including uh, highly intelligible speakers. And this one looked at uh, intelligibility scores rated by 15 experts and these 108 um, non-native speakers data. If you look at this chart, uh, you know, I'm gonna explain these constructs again, just in case you are not familiar. I looked at accentedness, comprehensibility and intelligibility. Let's look at the blue line, which is an intelligibility. You see the line is relatively linear uh, not like huge, like sharp, uh, perfect uh, linear relationship, but you see somewhat after 70% and after uh, you see some kind of uh, effect, but before 70% means, um, means like you make more errors, uh, lexical stress errors, then intelligibility drops significantly. I mean, there are many studies in the L2 speech field uh, talking about the importance of lexical stress uh, on second language intelligibility. So this finding is nothing new. Uh, prominence um, is also very important, but instead of showing the actual relationship, I want to uh, explain what prominence means because if you're not a, a pronunciation person, sometimes this terminology can be uh, new. So prominence is more like a sentence stress. You emphasize words within the sentence. So let's see what I meant by this. This is a native speaker's interaction. So let's listen. That was a great movie. That was a great movie. Yeah, so we emphasize, right, the term. Like, it's a great movie. So you spend a lot of time and energy and pitch to say it is a great movie. I mean, I didn't watch the uh, Wakanda forever, but apparently it's a great movie. So you want to emphasize it, right? But let's listen to uh, one uh, test uh, response uh, of non-native speakers. Code, newspaper, it just 45%. And, uh, and uh, donor, not into the university, as you can see, this person is emphasizing every word. That's a big problem. There's no important prominence. So this determines um, listeners and also raters uh, scores quite a bit. Speech rate. Many of you said the speech rate is important. Yes, indeed, it is an important. And many of the automated speaking uh, systems incorporates a speaking feature. But what I want to say here is if you look at, uh, let's look at the green line this time, which is comprehensibility. The green line is moving up, 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 up in the middle. And around the horizontal line is the length, like it's, uh, in this case, articulation rate. And after that is going down. So what we find out here is just because you use speech rate is important, that doesn't mean there's a linear relationship. You can't just speak fast, 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 fast. There's an optimal point. Then it's going to go down. If you speak too fast, it's not intelligible or comprehensible. If you speak too slow, it's not comprehensible. It has to be in the right point. And for us, it was a 3.5 to 4.25 syllable per second, but uh, it was pretty similar to uh, Monroe and Doing's 2001 study. The point here is speech rate shows a covilinear relationship. 
And that's the tricky part. Silent pause. And again, I'm sure many of you agree that pause is important. Like how many times you pause, you know, how uh, long you pause. So there is some relationship, especially for the comprehensibility. It kind of went down um, after the pause is longer than one second, right? So it's kind of going down. You might wonder why the blue line intelligibility is not going down. Here, the expert raters rated intelligibility score through transcription. So in this particular case, for listeners, I mean the raters, if there's a longer pause, they were able to transcribe better. So this is not a, an accurate, uh, mm, clear cut uh, relationship. But what I want to say is, let's take a look at this. On the right, the main difference between the pause patterns of L2 learners and native speakers is not about the number, but about where. So that's the, the main thing. So let's take a look at this example. This one, uh, my team analyzed highly intelligible uh, university professors um, uh, spoken uh, is pretty much a read aloud a text lecture. Uh, the top one is American professors uh, actual recording. And then bottom one was um, international uh, professors uh, recording. And this was used for my previous TOEFL study. And both speakers, by the way, uh, uh, presented the TOEFL listening passages and uh, TOEFL test takers didn't necess necessarily have significant uh, differences in their listening test scores. But when you really examine uh, their pause patterns, when you look at this highlighted um, the green, um, neon greens, those are the ones that uh, have differences. So you can see international professors tend to have more pauses, but then in a different locations, right? So that's the tricky part. It's about where we pause. Okay, so my uh, the next one is pronunciation segmentals. So we uh, I talked about uh, stress, I talked about stra uh, the, the prominence and pause and speech rate. And also I mentioned uh, segmentals are important uh, in terms of uh, pronunciation. So here, this one we analyzed uh, again, Cambridge uh, English assessments on files and the red one, uh, the red line, is dropping quite significantly, as you can see, instead of the orange one. So here I would like to introduce the term functional load. And uh, if you are familiar with uh, second language speech, you may have might have heard of this ter uh, term quite a bit. But functional load means setting priorities in the teaching of segmentals. So you rank segmental contrast according to their importance in English pronunciation. In other words, like a pap bat, these contrasts are more important than poor poor, like a th, th. So here we, I even had a chart, um, uh, person, person, you misunderstand quite significantly. Uh, but if I say three and three or, or three, especially three and three, like a thank you, thank you, you still understand. So the uh, contrast itself is not very important. Leave, leave is very important, right? So this is not something I created. This one, I followed this um, the concept of relative functional load by Catford, 1987. So, um, you know, I'm not teaching all of these features, but I would like you to have an idea about when it comes to vowels and consonants, there are some prioritized features, okay? Uh, my last one is intonation. Um, what I meant by tone choices and intonation. So this one, we looked at intonation tone choices, especially in the context of making a request. It's a pragmatic function. Um, uh, in this task, uh, participants had to uh, make a request about you know, asking for a recommendation letter, a high imposition. The red line is representing 
um, very low proficiency uh, learners, whereas the purple uh, line at the bottom is native speakers and the black line is highly proficient. As you can see, there's a vast difference between the low proficiency learners and the native speakers or high proficiency learners, especially uh, in terms of using rising tone in the high imposition situation. Uh, an example is, let's say you're asking your professors to write a recommendation letter. You, as a proficient speaker or native speaker, would notice they tend to say, oh, uh, professor, I was wondering whether you can write a recommendation letter for me. Like, uh, you can use a very flat tone. Not flat, it's like a level tones, right? Whereas, low proficient speakers will say, can you write a recommendation letter for me? You have like immediate rising tone. But actually, it means a completely different thing. And using a different tone choices makes a big difference. This is uh, an analysis we just finished by using IELTS uh, spoken data. Uh, as you can see, this is the use of a level. Blue one is uh, falling tone, and orange one is a level tone. Um, B1, B2, and C1. As you can see from B2 and C1, their use of tone choice, level tone and rising tones go, uh, are changing uh, quite significantly. And this was a significant predictor of their uh, speaking proficiency level. So in our daily conversation, according to Pickering, uh, we use 60% of falling tones. 30% of rising tones and 10% of level tones. But the issues with our test takers or language learners, they use too many times of level tones, like a bit too much, more than what we usually do. Then what I mean by all of these choices, tone choices, I mean, you know, as an intonation person like me, you know, we use these terms all the time, but some of you might not be familiar with the all these level tones, what do I mean by the level of falling or rising? So that, um, Pickering, uh, uh, Lucy has, has a nice chart here describing what each of these tone uh, choices could represent in our discourse, um, intonation discourse or discourse context. So here falling tones often, uh, means you are giving out the statement. Uh, it's more of the authority too. So right now, me as a speaker, I'm using a lot of falling tones, by the way, because I'm delivering information to you. And I, you know, if I use too many rising tones, you will question my authority. Does she really know what she's talking about? So I'm supposed to use falling tones at the moment. Uh, rising tone is a seeking approval, uh, solidarity, inclusiveness. So you can see teenagers, my daughter, by the way, she's using a lot of rising tones, by the way. Uh, uh, so that is a characteristics of rising tone. Level tone is more like you are listing items, sometimes withdrawing from the negotiations, purely about the language aspect and neutral. That's why when you are uh, requesting, you tend to use a, a level tone. So all of these intonation features can be quite complex, as you can see. My question is, can the computer process all of these features? Finally, the rhythm, uh, some of the automated speaking uh, systems or speaking uh, uh, features can include the rhythm. Uh, here we looked at uh, delta syllable length. So it's more of the standard deviations of syllable length. Uh, an example here is like, uh, what are the disadvantages of a greenhouse effect? Sometimes out of the blue, learners can pronounce green very long, right? So you measure some of the length of this syllable and try to see uh, what it means uh, to the speaker's proficiency. Uh, here you can see slightly covilinear relationship too, like a, the line is going up and then going down. So overall, I've shared a lot of these features right now. Uh, the important thing is the relationship is not that straightforward. Sometimes it's not the quantity matters, but it's the quality, where the pauses and location of pauses. 
What about the priority of the features, right? Some features are more important than others. And all of these intonation features, right? The tone choices. So those are the things that we have to consider when it comes to automated scoring. And these, I mean, the same thing. These features can uh, determine the speaker's intelligibility. And I'm pretty much repeating uh, all of this information. But these studies didn't necessarily look at the um, English proficiency itself, looked at different constructs like comprehensibility and intelligibility and listening comprehension, et cetera. What I would like to uh, mention here is I actually did the two studies, one with ETS data, another with the Duolingo data. Uh, the, I selected highly intelligible speakers and these test takers have to take the listening comprehension test by listening to these varieties of accents. Especially when you look at the circle parts, those are the speakers who didn't create any differences in test takers listening scores, uh, listening comprehension scores. And I wanted to look at what features can determine their intelligibility. Uh, and same thing, I also uh, did this study with the Duolingo uh, listening test. In this case, uh, Duolingo listening test is a dictation. So instead of a listening passage listening, this was a dictation. You see, Dictation one, dictation two, dictation three. One, they had to listen to uh, inner circle accent, American accent and British accent. Dictation two, they listened to their own accent. Dictation three, they listened to another L2 accent. Uh, you can see slight movement in the middle means test takers performed slightly better uh, when they listened to uh, their own accent. But if you look at dictation one and dictation two, there was no significant difference. In other words, as long as speakers are highly intelligible, um, listeners didn't uh, necessarily have a problem. What was a little tricky was when test takers listen to another L1 accent, especially listening to an Indian accent, they had a hard time. So there we have some complexity happening. But what I wanna share is the, the features that determines the intelligible speaker. Same thing, you know, they all talk about the consonant and vowels and, but lexical stress was very important. Here, we couldn't allow any more than one or two lexical stress errors. Prominence was especially important. And then using the right variations of falling and rising versus level was very, very important. So. Overall, uh, our recent data analysis confirmed that highly intelligible speakers here on the chart uh, on the horizontal line pretty much involves the speaking features and the vertical line Y acts represents intelligibility score. Uh, what we found out in this recent study was that the space is the prominence, how often you emphasize words, speech rate, and especially high functional segmental deviations and silent pause and lexical stress. These were the important features that determines speaker's intelligibility. So I'm repeating um, uh, some of the information again and again, but this is what we confirmed uh, in our recent studies. Okay, so I've spent a lot of time explaining these features. What does that mean to automated scoring assessment? Uh, as you can see, these features are relatively similar. These automated scoring uh, programs looked at fluency features, vocabulary features, grammatical accuracy features, but you know, in a more computerized manner, like a global language model score. Pronunciation is more acoustic model, right? Uh, or uh, goodness. Uh, um, of phone for, uh, pronunciation, but they are looking at various features on uh, uh, pronunciation, uh, mostly segmental stuff. But what I wanna mention here is these relationship with the features could change depending on what construct we measure. And also, uh, like I mentioned earlier, 
All these programs don't necessarily look at comprehensive features. They select features uh, for their own modeling. So first, fluency. Uh, these studies in red looked at fluencies only. That was their construct of interest. Um, the one in red, especially uh, these studies too, looked at pronunciation quality was their uh, uh, outcome variable. Uh, black and all was accuracy, pronunciation accuracy was their dependent variable. Uh, my study looked at intelligibility and Saito's study looked at comprehensibility. That means these features in relation to these constructs. So, and finally, these studies looked at oral proficiency. So when we look at different automated scoring systems, we always have to think about what constructs they've been examining along with what features they uh, selected. Of course, when it comes to constructs, you know, we have different terms, right? And I, uh, we looked at oral proficiency earlier uh, and then fluency. They are not the same thing. In a broad definition, fluency can refer to proficiency sometimes, but they're not the same thing. Accent and proficiency is not the same thing. Also, I mentioned three constructs earlier, intelligibility, comprehensibility, and accentedness. They are not the same thing. In the field of second language speech, uh, we define these terms currently uh, based on uh, Mono and Doing and Doing and Mono's uh, um, research-based uh, definitions. So intelligibility is more about how much the listener understands, but comprehensibility is how easy it is to understand. Accentedness is about the difference of your speech uh, in relation to, um, to the speaker. So these are the construct definitions, but it's important for us to think about how we define these constructs, okay? All right, so I have two sessions left um, and we have about 10 minutes or so. Uh, the, the other two sessions are more of um, the future directions or things to consider. Like uh, uh, I will be sharing very recent findings, but um, there's no concrete answers to it. All right, so let's briefly review the architecture of the automa uh, automatic uh, scoring systems. Um, and some of you might be familiar, but in case you've never uh, thought about uh, this automated scoring system, this is like a very brief version of uh, the whole uh, architecture. So once you have your learner speech, speech input, uh, it goes through a speech uh, uh, recognition system, uh, ASR, uh, which converts the speech into text. And that will go to the speech uh, extraction stage, uh, which selects features that are relevant to speaking, you know, speaking construct. Again, I talked about the construct briefly, depending on how we define speaking, uh, features can change, right? And that will move on to scoring model uh, that will, uh, where extracted features can predict overall proficiency scores. And later it goes to the test takers with actual test score. So this is like a very a simple version. And what is really happening in the speech uh, ASR system, speech recognizer process? You got the audio input, and then you go through signal processing and uh, acoustic model, going to the language model, and then you ended up having the output. So where this uh, in this acoustic model, uh, this one will take audio signals and they will map sound into phonemes and words. And, you know, as a intonation prosody person, uh, my research team and I, we are trying to introduce intonation prosody into this acoustic model. Uh, and that was our previous work. Language model can uh, estimate the probability of the hypothesized words, hypothesized words, and the sequences based on the training corpora. So here, as you can see, the computer system needs to be trained with something. And currently is open uh, based on the native speakers sound files. But the question here in the field of world Englishes and you know, global Englishes, now this is the question. Should we continue to use native speaker as a training model or something else, right? So that 
becomes that comes to the validity issues. Uh, I listened to Dr. Harding's uh, webinar uh, a couple of months ago, and he was, you know, uh, very nicely um, sharing issues related to English as a lingua franca in a language assessment uh, aspects. So, as we know, you know, assessment standards still maintain the nativeness principle, but now we may need to move on to intelligibility principle. And here on the right, over the next 10, 20 years, emerging Englishes will take on a role as a pedagogical and assessment models. So, I mean, me as a linguist, it's easier said than done, for sure. Trying to use these intelligibility models using non-native speakers as a training model would be far more complex. And already the automated scoring system itself is complex. But I think this is something to think about for us. And this involves the feedback too. Um, I'm going to give you some time here uh, for you to think about. And this is actually the actual feedback form that uh, my research team has developed after uh, we are working on this automated speech assessment tool, specifically focusing on intelligibility. So let's say you received a, a, a feedback form like this from us and you are language learners. Your intelligibility score is a 97%. Your syllable speech rate is 4.6 syllable per second. We actually thought this is a pretty cool. Wow, we could give learners the intelligibility score and we can tell them how fast they speak and you know, giving them an awareness and this can make them improve their pronunciation or intelligibility quickly. Yeah, but it wasn't uh, as, as easy as we thought. So I'm gonna come back to that feedback. Here, um, I retrieved this data. Mm, this is actually available on the website. TOEFL uh, speech rater. And uh, as we know, they have uh, three dimensions, delivery, language use, and uh, topic development. And their speech rater provides feedback like this. Uh, speech rate, you can see pause. I'm sure it's very tiny. I try to put everything all together on one page. Uh, then there's a repetition, vocabulary depth, and grammatical accuracy, and discourse coherence, right? Uh, looks like test takers can receive feedback like this. And the next one is more complete version uh, for speech rate. So how fast you speak uh, and then impact. Speaking rate has a strong impact and dimension details. Your speaking rate scores 87 out of 100, right? So imagine you have received something like this. That's very detailed. I think it's, it could be quite uh, helpful uh, in this manner. But um, the feedback I just uh, shared earlier, this is based on uh, my research team's ongoing project. Here, we try to provide computerized immediate intelligibility scores and feedback to help out uh, their pronunciation. And that was the feedback. I just cut the first two parts. They actually even received uh, scores at the top. Um, you know, very details, you know, it took a lot of time for us to prepare something like this. Uh, but if you look at the result, uh, you see the lexical stress, speech rate, basically uh, nothing was significant, everyone. Uh, they didn't improve much. I'm sure some of you may share uh, same concerns. The problem was when we told the students, you have a 4.2 syllable per second, that didn't mean anything to learners. They couldn't understand what it meant. Like, when then what is a three syllable per second? An intelligibility score itself, like 87%, it didn't really mean much to them either. Uh, it has a trend, but uh, effect wasn't significant. The next, we also try to this time give them an actual automatic speech analyzer instantly. So knowing that they can understand the, uh, the meaning of 4.6 syllable per second, we let them use this tool, 
they say something, click, they instantly get this report. Also, we gave them another uh, model version. So let them listen and repeat and listen and repeat. Uh, and at least by doing so, their speech rate improved. So, I mean, this is like a, a the, the very long and huge projects, but by doing this research, what we learned is if we are providing automatic scoring-based feedback along with the scores, what we found out is we also have to train learners and teachers or users in terms of these terms and uh, its own meaning itself. Otherwise, I mean, it's very detailed. It could be very useful, but it may not really play its role as effectively as we expect. That's what we learned. All right, so the very last, uh, I've covered many different things today. I mean, I probably have prepared too much. Um, I really wanted to say when it comes to uh, linguistic features in speaking, it's not that straightforward. Uh, it's very complex. Uh, and also, you know, we often do a quantitative analysis, but sometimes the qualitative part is very important. Uh, at the same time, the current issues is no, uh, we don't necessarily uh, look at the interactive features that much in an automated sc scoring system, at least in the current uh, um, field, because it's too complex. Mon uh, monologic speech itself is already complex. Imagine two people are speaking together and how computer can process that, how we process intonation. Also, I already mentioned task differences. Uh, we also have to think about L1 specific features, right? And I mentioned using non-native speakers as a computer training model, uh, but that creates another level of uh, uh, complications, I'm sure. And the watchback effect is something to uh, think about. I wanna uh, share uh, two more slides briefly for you to think about when it comes to interaction features. Uh, this basically, means nothing's straightforward. Uh, in my earlier uh, speech analysis, number of turns between two interlocutors was a strong predictor of their proficiency. If there's an interaction feature, uh, uh, task uh, by uh, analyzing these sound files. But in a uh, very recent study, um, you know, the comparing uh, the human interaction with a machine and human interaction with another human, although the linguistic features could be comparable, but when human participants interact with automated agent, they don't exchange many terms. So this is like one immediate uh, complication. Turn is not something you could even uh, consider because everything's gotta be all controlled there, right? Uh, how about this one when it comes to intonation? I introduced tone choices earlier, but intonation is far more than tone choices. Uh, and this is, let's listen to this one. It wasn't my fault, was it? No, of course it wasn't. Definitely not. So when it comes to the interaction between two people, and if we want to look at the intonation, we call something, uh, we have something called Pitch concord means both speakers are supposed to use the same pitch height. That pretty much indicates their common ground. Like okay, if someone says it wasn't my fault, was it? No, of course not. If you actually use a very low pitch, then uh, you basically lose your friend. You know, you're not on the same page. Uh, so we have this very subtle very intuitive use of intonation that takes place in a natural human and human conversation. But how does machine process this is the question as well, right? So overall, uh, my message here is, I mean, the topic of my webinar is about understanding language for the automated speaking assessment. Um, when it comes to 
speaking assessment, we look at grammar, fluency, pronunciation, you know, potentially pragmatic and interactional competence, all of these features later. But what features to analyze, what features to be included in this uh, uh, scoring systems, and what it means to our students, um, that itself is very important, but um, far more complicated than we think. So uh, one thing is if we start to emphasize fluency so much, then perhaps our learners going to study fluency all uh, all the time, but not necessarily other features, right? Uh, this washback effect is so important in our uh, uh, practice. So we definitely have to uh, take that into consideration. Also the practicality. Um, how is the test potentially administered in the real life uh, practice? You know, the cheating and security. I didn't mention any of these issues because Today's focus is all about uh, language and linguistic features, but there are many other things to uh, think about when it comes to automated speaking um, assessment. All right, so it was a long talk, an hour, and I've covered a lot of information, but I hope <laughs> some of that would be of use to you. Um, Okim, do you have a little time? Um, we're we're scheduled to keep on through um, the end of the hour, so we have some questions in the chat. If you have oh, yes, yes. time, um, I think maybe I will go back up to the beginning and 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 try to go through some of our first questions. Um, one person had asked what when you referenced, um, and this is just I think for sort of point of reference, but had asked when you talk about expert raters, um, what. What makes them expert? How, how do you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is that is an also an important uh, definition. Uh, some studies will say expert raters would be someone who have teaching uh, English teaching experience. But for me, in this studies, expert raters are the one who had been trained in assessment and phonetic skills as well. So all of these students were grad students who have taken. Uh, my uh, phonetic uh, seminars, and they've been all uh, previous ESL teachers. So it involves a teaching backgrounds and linguistic background and assessment background. Um, and uh, Nuria, I hope that's how I pronounce it, has asked uh, whether body language is something that could be factored into automated speaking assessment. Aha, uh -huh. I think I've never thought about it. Yeah, but potentially, I mean, in fact, uh, speech, in, uh, speech engineering teams are looking at emotions uh, and emotion is related to intonation. So how emotion can be played uh, uh, into this automated scoring uh, uh, process. It doesn't have to be automated scoring itself, but general computerized uh, systems, but body language itself would be, a lot more complicated. I mean, the speech input was, as you could see, is nothing straightforward, yeah. but that means you have to look at your eyeball movement, your mouth movement, your skin, and sometimes, you know, your energy changes. So we are definitely adding more complexity to this world, but yes, something to think about. I haven't tried anything. That'd be interesting to see how that works. That'd be very, very interesting. Um, maybe one of you out there can pursue that in your own in your own research. Um, uh, let's see. Look, moving on here, we've got another. Um, Wasim asks: Does the automated assessment measure functional ability of the examinee and cohesion in the speech sample? And what about how articulate the speaker is? So again, you know, the functional part I mentioned briefly about the pragmatic skills, right? And pragmatic skill is a lot to do with uh, task completion. Um, and oftentimes it's related to the uh, interactive task. So let's say you are making an, um, I mean, this course completion task is much straight, much more straightforward and simpler, but in a real life pragmatic context, you know, you have to have an interlocutor, you're uh, uh, making an apology or you're making a request. So it could involve not only the task completion itself, 
um, but appropriateness of your own language use, right? Are you using the right terms, you know, right tone? So I don't think we are that far away, that far to incorporate all of these pragmatic features in the uh, automatic uh, uh, assessment uh, uh, programs yet, but I'm sure many testing agencies are, uh, sees are including Duolingo, uh, are interested in developing and expanding their functions uh, in order to incorporate uh, these additional pragmatic skills. Coherence, you mentioned, is also a complicated concept. I only shared speech rate, you know, maybe some quantitative features like a number of uh, first 1,000 words, like a number of like, a, um, you know, a grammatical uh, uh, complexities, uh, the key units and all of those. Those are easy to count, but Cohesive features, you know, some studies looking at like an inclusion of introduction seems to be a strong predictor. Some studies will say how you use discourse features, but it requires additional semantic analysis. And that creates more complexity. So I don't think uh, automated scoring systems would uh, intentionally underestimate uh, or downgrade the importance of these functional and cohesive features, but this is more of the current reality of the computerized systems. We could uh, more easily um, quantify uh, things for some of the features, but some others, when it comes to the meaning and semantic issues, uh, it's just difficult. That's where we are. But uh, again, we are, uh, continuously in making efforts to improve systems. So I'm sure in the next 10 years, we'll see uh, whole different outcomes. Um, zooming out now to kind of a, a broader question. Um, Sun Young asks that um, given that English is widely used as a lingua franca, to what extent do you think the automated speaking assessment systems can or should take into account different varieties of English? I know. so. Um, I personally would like to argue that, you know, I mentioned this whole uh, ASR training, uh, computer training system. We have to incorporate uh, different varieties of accents, uh, but highly intelligible speakers as a model, as a training model. Uh, and when we receive um, speaking scores, we ended up uh, getting potentially two different sets of speaking scores. In fact, that's what my research team is doing for the intelligibility scores. The intelligibility scores are supposed to be automated. So once input is uh, uh, put in, then we are supposed to automatically get the intelligibility scores. Early on, we used the native speakers uh, speech samples as a, a training model. But then gradually we are putting non-native speakers, highly intelligent speakers as a uh, training models so that learners end up receiving two scores in terms of their, uh, not just the scores, but also their feedback. So your uh, score is 80% closer to the uh, highly intelligent speakers, but perhaps uh, maybe 30, 70% closer to the uh, native speakers. Um, uh, model. So learners can be aware of the differences between the intelligible scores, uh, intelligibility speakers, and native speakers. And it's our responsibility as teachers as well. I mean, we should educate learners that, um, you know, for the successful global communication, you don't have to be the native speaker like accent person. You can be highly intelligible speaker, and we give them two different options. I mean, that was my idea. And that's what we are working on for our automated uh, intelligibility score. But when it comes to high proficiency test uh, context, it, it's far more uh, complicated, I think. And giving learners different option is already confusing. Um, but, we as researchers and teachers, um, 
we have that responsibility of making an effort to incorporate different varieties. And again, by doing so, we are really creating a different uh, instructional model, which means learners will try to value different accents and different varieties. But if we are removing this idea of varieties, thinking that this creates more complexity, that means learners will never have that motivation of learning new varieties, if that makes sense. So uh, reality and complexity is one thing, but our effort and responsibility is another. And I think we should just continue to uh, move on with those two uh, dynamics. Um, Camilla asks something that kind of goes hand in hand with this question, which is that considering that there are more non-native speakers of English than native speakers of English around the world, um, and that even native speakers have huge variation and English is used in intercultural yeah. communication in complex ways, should we even continue to measure how fluent speakers are based on native speakers? Um, and if so, why? I think that's why I shared some of the slides about intelligible speakers, right? So I think, and that's the work that I've been doing for the last 10, 12 years. I would like to find out the features that characterize intelligible speakers. And in fact, intelligible speakers tend to have a certain speech rate, but like I mentioned, it's a covilinear relationship. At certain point, somehow that speech rate is most ideal for that speakers with an accent. But you, you know, everyone has an accent, we know. So you have your own accent, but if you speak too fast, listeners don't seem to understand, right? So somehow, if you try to have a target of that optimal point, that makes your speech intelligible. I think that would be our goal, um, not only for the speech rate, but also for the pause, but also for the rhythms. But when it comes to the lexical stress, you know, Jennifer Jenkins is lingua franca core. She also mentions the importance of uh, lexical stress contrast. Whether you're communicating with the native speakers and native uh, non-native speakers or non-native speakers and non-native speakers, somehow lexical stress contrast makes a huge role. So pronouncing certain features accurately, whether you have a native speaker background or non-native speaker background seems to be important. But when it comes to speech rates or some others, probably not as important, if that makes sense. But I think we should continue to, and at least that's what I've been arguing, continue to make an effort uh, into promoting different varieties and English as a lingua franca, English as an international language. And this movement itself will eventually change our learners' perspectives. In fact, I did a study with 120 ESL, EFL teachers around the world, asking teachers about whether or not they would be willing to incorporate highly intelligible non-native speakers speech uh, as a instructional model in their own listening speaking classrooms. Many of the teachers still said no. The reason was because my learners, my students don't like it, right? And that's the reality, I think. But if we continue to introduce things and tell them that it's not, is the world is changing, the testing uh, whole paradigms is changing, then they will catch up. Um, I, have another, I have one more question kind of tied to this, this conversation. Um, Dan Isbell says that he's curious how we can work to focus on intelligibility and comprehensibility and exclude accentedness when despite being conceptually different, ratings of accentedness tend to correlate rather strongly with comprehensibility at the group level. So he says it seems um, hard to do with human raters and is interested in how or whether machine scoring can, can deal with that challenge. So Dan is asking whether we can remove the accent in this. I think so, Dan. If you want to chime in on the chat, I know you can't. Um... Dan, do you want to just remove <laughs> the whole accent in this? If you want to clarify, um, we'll get. I'll, I'll maybe I'll I'll move on to another question while we give. Dan yeah, but I can briefly briefly answer. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've been talking about intelligibility quite a bit, and yes, accent in this itself. You know, it's not something we need to promote, but 
the the project that I'm working on uh, uh, with my uh, research team uh, about this uh, intelligibility, I've noticed the computer engineering teams, uh, their whole uh, computer systems were based on accent and accentiness and accent classifiers. And for them, accent was the first indicator to look at the deviations between the input and the model. Uh, Although the recent findings of my project did show that there's a big differences between uh, accentiness and also intelligibility, even the computer could uh, make the differences, uh, it looks like. So eventually, if we can go with the comprehensibility and intelligibility as a target construct, that would be, it would be great. But I personally wonder, uh, how realistic it is going to be in the current world uh, with uh, the technology available uh, in the engineering field. Uh, but maybe many years later, we should really move on to uh, the key constructs, which is comprehensibility and intelligibility. Yeah. And by the way, accent in this, that construct is very heavily and importantly used in a speech pathology field as well, because it's, you know, intelligibility is important, but also the accent in this is all about the deviation of the speaker, and they are using that construct uh, very frequently, I've noticed. So again, what we have now can be different from what we will have in the next 10 years. Um, I think we probably have time for one more question. Um, let me see. So, um, oh, where's the one I wanted to, uh, Jay Gao um, asks, how do we integrate these speech features with lexical and grammatical features in assessment? For example, a speech with native-like pronunciation but ungrammatical sentences versus speech with accents but grammatical sentences and rich content. I know, this is actually, the complication. In fact, um, you know, studies have shown, however, that when you put all of these features together, lexical features, pronunciation features, fluency features, and grammatical features, fluency tends to be the top predictor, followed by sometimes grammatical complexity, sometimes by lexical uh, richness or range, and sometimes the pronunciation. Uh, or sometimes grammatical and lexical features, they go together. So we don't necessarily have to like a, put everything together. When it comes to comprehensibility studies, some studies looked at like uh, all these features and saying somehow lexical use is uh, not a very important feature. But when we just isolate constructs, a lot of these analysis, you know, I use the control the speech means they read and read aloud text, which case is all about fluency and pronunciation. I think in a way, when it comes to accent, by definition, is a phonological characteristics of someone's speak, someone's speech. So for the sake of convenience, I tend to eliminate grammatical and lexical features intentionally and purely look at the pronunciation features and try to determine which features more contribute. But in a spontaneous speech, in an automated uh, speaking systems, I don't think people necessarily um, downgrade uh, the other linguistic features. So uh, uh, ETS's speech rater, you know, uh, Zetzner's uh, 2009 studies, they selected 11 features out of many, right? 11 features apparently making contributions to the their uh, uh, TOEFL automated speaking uh, system uh, scores. And yes, uh, pause, speech rate, you know, all of these were there and there was lexical and grammatical feature as a one variable. So it is there, but whether or not, um, you know, uh, we tease out these features extensively. And just like I said, with the fluency in pronunciation, like how we um, uh, incorporate uh, is somewhat 
uh, a different story. I mean, when it comes to automated scoring, I mentioned the language model, right? The, I have introduced the acoustic model and language model. So these grammatical features and lexical features are supposed to be included in the language model, by the way. Uh, but the whole slides I shared today were more of the linguistic analysis and individual features. And I did emphasize more of the fluency and pronunciation features um, for sure. All right, I think we have time for one question. From it, from Anthony Conan himself. Yes, uh, thank you, Okin. Thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. I have a question. You've talked a lot about features yeah. uh, uh, that are used by different systems, and your own research has shown that uh, certain features are important and certain features are less important. Now, I want to ask you. Now, many of these automated systems have a lot of these features, but what seems to be critical is the weight given to these features. Yeah. Some features are given more weight and some features are given less weight. And of course, these automated systems operate like in a black box, so we don't know what the weights are. What do you think is the, the mix of the weights for these different features? You know, um, I didn't, I didn't have the slide here, but I prepared earlier something about which features are more important than others in the automated scoring system? And what I found out is some studies like uh, Katia Kucharini's, like, you know, uh, the researchers in the Netherlands, they created this um, automated uh, fluency uh, uh, scoring systems, only including fluency features. Mm -hmm. And they had a very high correlation with the human readers. My acoustic uh, prosody model, along with many other uh, um, uh, automatic scoring uh, uh, research studies, also showing that somehow fluency and, you know, the Ginther's study, same thing. She used uh, auto proficiency as a construct. Uh, only fluency features itself could create 80% of the correlation with the human readers. So some quite um, honestly, based on my own experience, fluency features seem to be the number one being weighted very heavily, currently at least. But many other automated scoring systems, and I introduced the speech construct as a pronunciation quality or pronunciation accuracies, accuracies. they also look at the pronunciation acoustic uh, form and structures or segmental features. For them, if it's gonna be only for the pronunciation um, quality uh, scoring systems, many other pronunciation features can be more heavily weighted. But for the general, um speaking proficiency at this point i think is fluency at the moment uh then many other features and some other grammatical lexical that could be added but i had to say i have to say that Automatic, you know, the whole language model and all of this acoustic model, that could be a black box. You put something and then you end up with a score. Uh, we don't know what is really happening here. But the one that, um, you know, uh, Dan Douglas's statement I shared earlier, language is never a one single feature production. Pronunciation goes with vocabulary, goes with grammar. It's a combination of everything. You cannot separate all of these features independently. So even though I mentioned fluency, I doubt that the fluency is only just the speech rate. How fast you speak in conjunction with your right act of pronunciation, with the right grammar, with the right vocabulary, if that makes sense. So that's going to be our job. Uh, uh, in this field, like identify exactly what is happening in this human uh, performance system and human evaluation systems, if that makes sense. So I don't know, Anthony, my question is, I don't know. <laughs> thank you, thank you. 
thank you so much for your time today, Okum. I think um, I think we'll have to wrap it up. Um, I have put in the chat a link to our YouTube, our research YouTube channel. You can go there for recordings of, we'll upload this one shortly, and we've got recordings of the other webinars that we've done this year. We will be continuing this series in the new year, so please stay tuned. We'll be sharing news with, with other speakers coming up um, in 2023. And thank you all for tuning in today. We really, we really appreciate it. Thank um so okay a lot of thanks are in the chat thank you thank you very much it was a very fascinating talk we really appreciate it thank you thank you thank you everybody bye-bye bye-bye